Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for this LinkedIn Live event. I'm Janet McFarland, the Financial Services Editor at The Globe and Mail, and I'm joined today by Robin Doolittle, an investigative reporter at The Globe, and by Chen Wang, a data journalist at The Globe. Robin and Chen and a group of other reporters have spent months researching and writing a series of stories that we call our Power Gap Project. It looks at how women are faring in Canada in senior roles, the power roles in our society, across an array of sectors. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the role of women in the public or government sector and more about women in senior private sector jobs. Before we get started, I just want to say that I'm going to be asking Robin and Chen some of your questions today. So please post your questions in the comments section and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, I've also been asked to remind everyone that uh, before we start that to please keep your comments civil. Trolling, abuse, obscenities, or use of false information isn't what we're here for today. And if it happens, I've been asked to tell people you will be restricted on this stream. Okay, with that taken care of, let's get started with our discussion today. I'm going to start by turning to Robin um, and asking, Robin, could you please just tell people a little bit more about what the Power Gap Project is and how you got started? What was the genesis? Yeah, thanks. And thanks uh, for being here, everybody, if you're watching at home or on your phone or wherever. You should be at home, so watching at <laughs> home. Um, yeah, the power gap. It, this started back in 2018. Uh, we were um, thinking about what the next project would be for the globe. Uh, I was thinking a lot about what the next area I wanted to dig into from an investigative standpoint would be. This was in the post Me Too era where the conversation had really evolved uh, to one about gender inequities more broadly. There was a scandal happening in the UK. Uh, a number of BBC journalists, women journalists, realized that they were being paid dramatically less than their exact male equivalents. Um, and at the same time, I was about to take a maternity leave. So I was thinking a lot about how children were going to impact my career and other women's careers. And this led us down this road of thinking about, do we really understand the place of women in the modern workforce right now? I think you've probably heard the statistic that women make 87 cents for every dollar that a man makes. You've probably heard that women are dramatically underrepresented uh, among executives, uh, in C-suites, um, on corporate boards. But it just feels like we've been having this conversation forever and we wanted to dig Deeper. And what we did was we mass collected uh, public pay records for the one segment of the workforce where data is available, the public sector. And we drilled into individual workforces, uh, not just looking at the very top, but at every echelon uh, of the of the salary uh, of the workforce for everyone who uh, met the threshold for disclosure. And we found the thing one. Um, the glass ceiling is not at the very top in the way that people usually describe it. It's not just the president's office. Women were hitting the glass ceiling as mid-level managers. They just weren't getting anywhere close to the top. Um, and the other thing was that pay was still an issue. Um, not, a, not a huge issue, especially in kind of the lower levels, although it did widen at the very top. Um, but again, the, the, just the the... The bigger thing was this, the sheer um, number of men compared to women in, in these six-figure paying jobs and executive jobs and management jobs. And of the very few women who did break through, they're almost entirely white. That's the whole investigation in a very quick, but I could probably do quicker in the future, nutshell. <laughs> so why don't I ask Chen to talk a little bit about um, the public sector data that you collected? Uh, because... I've always had this impression that the public sector is forced by government mandate to be more uh, fair and to have uh, to pay more attention to pay equity and to hiring practices. So tell me a little bit about what you did and what you found. Yeah, so Robin already covered some analysis we did, and I want to give a little more introduction to our data set because that's why it took so long for us to do this investigation. Um, that's because it's not it's a lengthy process first uh, to navigate the legislation across the country. And our data set was compared of the salary records were collected from 244 entities from four main pillars um, in, in eight provinces. 
So, so like our four main pillars are uh, provincial governments, uh, municipal departments, universities, and the public owned corporations. And the final uh, data set logged about 90,000 people and information in, includes uh, their first and last names and uh, sometimes job titles and salary numbers and those informations and like elements data elements allowed us to do some analysis on their uh, gender split and also like dig into their salary wage gap uh, for each institution but also we zoomed into some like the top, the highest paid uh, group of people, and also like the power executive positions. So the conclusion here is basically women lag behind men by almost every metric. Though the extent varies a bit across entities and, and pillars. And I want to point to universities because that's basically the pillar that surprised us the most and also the one that we are digging uh, deeper into now. Um, so here are some findings we we have like university like so one of the analysis that we did it was like we divide people into uh, different salary bands based on their salaries and examine the gender split in each salary band and universities share a very similar pattern across the board that um, just above the disclosure threshold, they tend to really even 50-50, but moving up, women representation will slowly decline. And at the very top, women are easily outnumbered by 3 to 1 or 4 to 1. Um, and in another analysis where we examine the women representation through the lens of academic ranks, and we found that women uh, are concentrated in the associate and assistant professor level. Um, but like moving to the full professor level, like women are... Uh, the women representation declined to like less than 30 percent. So those are some findings we have. 30 percent of full professors are women? In yeah, like assistant and associate professor, the, the percentage may be 40, 50, but like declined when you when it comes to full professor. So like we applied those job title analysis and like wage analysis like on, on different uh, pillars and entities. So I encourage our viewers and readers that do go to our web pages to explore our data and, and um, search for the entities like you're interested. So I think you looked at something like 90,000 people um, yeah. and, and their jobs across these the public sector. Do you yeah. think, is there any reason to think that that offers any insight into pay levels in the private sector? I mean, how how much do you think that can be transported or... or, or uh, yeah, I, I think like the story probably quite similar in the private sector or even worse because one, we showed our uh, analysis to some experts and economists and based on their uh, what they say they tell us like uh, this pattern is mostly certain like almost certainly replicated in the private sector or even worse and i also want to point to some like two resources of our project where it can be uh, like to a certain level like uh, reflective of a private sector one is the public owned corporations which they're part of the public, uh, the public sector, but like they're structured and um, operated like uh, private services. So you can think of the business such as the power, water, or telecommunication companies, or uh, some companies that manage our regional transit or like handle pension funds. Um, so in general, like uh, this this pillar like is the worst has like the worst agenda divide of all the pillars. Oh both really? Yeah, both in terms of representation and every salaries. And it's and as we understand, this is mostly reflective of the private sector. So it, I think it's reasonable to think like the private sector might share a lot of like similar patterns we we were observed here. And some high level number here is um, like 70% of the those companies like men outnumber women and the overall gender split is as wide as 76% uh, men versus 24% women. So that's a really wide gap between genders. So another piece I want to point to is um, a story penned by our colleague, uh, Tavia Grant, and she examined um, uh, gender e equality through the lens of 20, 223 uh, uh, TSX, S&P composite companies. And that, that data only allowed us to look at the leadership, but we can glean some like insight from the public filings. 
So Robin, what did you, um, looking at these private sector, large, very large companies in the private sector, what did you, um, what did you come to conclude? Well, as, as Chen mentioned, uh, it was our colleague Tavia Grant that did this. I'm just trying to pull up her story now. Um, but you know, the, the, <laughs> The, the art on this story tells such a story. Um, they, they took headshots of all of the males, well, all of the CEOs, and there are very, very few women. Chen, maybe you can grab the actual stats, but- I think there were um, nine, right? And, there's, and, and one of them has since left. Um, was it nine? Uh, yeah, I, in total, it's, 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 it's only like, a, I think in total we have 220 some people, but only nine of them were women female. And I think like it's mentioned in a story, like put it another way, there are more uh, male uh, CEOs named Michael than uh, women, uh, female CEOs out of those like 200 corporations. And there has been some modest progress on the board side, like between 2015 and 2019, the percent of women on the boards of those companies actually increased from uh, 18% to 28%. But it's not really the case on the executive side. The percentage only increased from 15% to 18%, um, as I remember. So there's a lot of work need to be done on the executive level. And, and um, Tavia also compiled another data set out of, uh, from the public filings, which was uh, the, the NEOs we call here, like basically the CEOs, CFOs, and the highest paid uh, uh, executive officers of those companies. And that's a database about like a thousand people of the most power, I would say. And uh, only 13% of that group of people are women. And a hand of them were uh, black women, indigenous women, and women of color. So like the, the representation at the leadership of Copper Canada doesn't really remotely represent the uh, demographic makeup of our population. And that's just the leadership that the, the, the lack of data transparency didn't really allow us to drill down to middle, le uh, middle level management or even lower as we did for the public sector as Robin just mentioned, like the glass ceiling sometimes is much lower than we expected, several rounds above the disclosure threshold, but we are not really able to know the full picture of the private sector at this moment. Yeah, I, I, as somebody who's a little bit older, I feel like we've been talking about this for the lack of women in executive roles in Canada for decades and every generation of women, and I've talked to women who are a generation ahead of me and they've expressed in the past you know, a lot of disappointment because they were sort of coming into business um, in the 70s and the 80s where there was so much hope that, you know, the world was changing and it's changed so slowly. And Robin, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about why? I mean, you've, you've spent, <laughs> you've spent what, two years now talking mm -hmm. to these people, but why, why is change in this area um, so difficult to, um, to have happen? happen? Yeah. Okay. So I think there's a couple things. Let's start first with the fact that I think the conversations that has, we've been having in the years leading up to now have been very important, of course, highlighting the lack of women CEOs, the lack of women in executive suites, women on boards, the, the overall wage gap is obviously hugely important. What the Power Gap series is trying to do is, is shift the conversation to where I think, um, to where I think the reporting shows it needs to be. And that's, if you're just focusing on the very top, you're missing what's happening at that level because it's really the middle that people are getting stuck in. And while our data shows what's happening in the public sector, as Chen mentioned, we do have detailed data for more than 80 uh, crown and public corporations. These are entities that are very closely linked to what is happening in the private sector. They hire out of the private sector. They are structured like private companies. They are very good comparators for private sector entities. Um, if anything, though, they're probably a little bit better because there is more uh, transparency on them as they are connected to government. And what we find there, and you can see this on our website, is that you know, women's representation isn't great anyway among six-figure earners. But that you know, by the very highest, the top ten salary band, that that those very highest earners. Um, less than 20% of those people are women. 
And, you know, even by the middle, we can see kind of about halfway to the top, the numbers just start to crater off. And this is where I think uh, there's been, you know, um, maybe some missed opportunities is by just focusing on the top. Of course, there's no women at the top. There's no women in the middle. There's no women on the way to the top, right? When we looked at um, these different entities, companies, institutions, universities, corporations, we looked at salaries, but we also looked at job titles. And um, just as Chen identified some of the issues in universities around the number of professors, um, what we also did searches on job titles like manager, senior manager, director, executive director, senior manager, vice president, um, men outnumbered women almost everywhere at every one of those job titles. And almost always they out earned them as well. So that's a big piece is the transparency. And um, in the interest of not rambling on forever, uh, there's a whole other component of this, which gets into the lack of enforcement of Canadian laws and the broader sociological and cultural barriers that women face in the workplace. Yeah, Do you I want me to talk about those? Well, I'll come to those in a minute. Um, I just would like to just sort of explore the bottleneck question. And um, and we actually have a question from a listener about that very fact. Um, it's a question, and I'm sorry, I apologize in advance. It's from Penny's Kosrochei. I'm sorry about your name mispronunciation, but um, but the question is, I appreciate the numbers that have been gathered in the series. What, in your view, is the most important conclusion derived from the data, um, and how does it contribute to the existing discourse on the wage gap? And in, in particular, the question says that women in professional public sector making over hundred thousand dollars a year face a bottleneck in mid management, and you know it's quite clear from your data that they do. Um, but why should this be when there are so many women coming in at the bottom of the, uh, at the bottom of the, of well, the structure? Janet, that is like a big point that we haven't actually underscored yet is it's not that there aren't women. When you look at the lowest salary bands in the places that we collected, there are women. It's pretty evenly split. I'm not saying it's 50, 50. It is some places 50, 50, but between, uh, you know, like the kind of 45, 55, range. There, there's a lot, right? So there are women. They just aren't making it up. And why is that? And that is a good segue to what I was going to talk about earlier is there's really, I think, two things happening here. One are the many well-documented, researched um, issues related to stereotypes and biases that hold women back at work. Uh, and the other is the fact that there are you know, decades old laws on the books preventing gender discrimination in all of its forms, and they're almost impossible to enforce. So those two things working together, I think, are are, are, a, are a big part of it. Um, let's go to the, the first one, the cultural and sociological barriers. So, I mean, this comes back to just basic stuff. Like when you ask people to draw a leader, what do they draw? They draw pictures of men. And this goes into our idea of what is a leader. And I think that some of the traits that people will talk about is, you know, ambitious and aggressive and stern and this kind of old school image. Uh, and um, they happen to be uh, traits that are associated with the traditional masculine man, right? And women, when they exhibit those traits, so this is kind of like double whammy here. Women, when they exhibit those traits, they're viewed as negative in women, but positive in men. And they also happen to be associated with leadership. And at the same time, when women stray from um, traditional female characteristics, uh, well, that this is all leading into the, this, this same bias against them, is that they're, they're supposed to be kind of kind and soft and supportive. Um, which doesn't help them climb up the ladder. Uh, but when they don't do those things, it also hurts them. There's yeah. also research that shows that women are actually penalized for, um, for success. They're viewed as more negatively than men. We know that women still carry a bulk of the household duties and unpaid uh, work at home. Um, and, and there has been research that shows that I think something like, and I think it was a study in Denmark, maybe Norway, one of those countries, um, that showed that women's earnings over the course of their career dropped by something like 20% after having children, and it didn't impact fathers uh, at all. So 
there's all these kind of cultural biases around whose job is it really to take care of children. I can tell you my inbox since writing this series is filled with um, this, this notion. Um, and I guess there's one more thing I want to say is I want to get away a little bit from this, this framing of um, that, that the argument here is that women's place is absolutely not in the home and that that's what we're trying to say. And that's, that's not it. This is, if someone wants to stay home and take care of their kids, that's amazing. If someone doesn't want to um, sign up for a job that's going to have them working 110 hours a week, that's great for either gender. The point of this is that if that isn't your bag, if you want to, you know, go high, as high as you can in your field, you shouldn't encounter uh, additional barriers because of your gender or your race or your sexual orientation yeah. or how you identify um, based on your gender. So I think that this is the point of the series. Um, and there's a great article, actually, that we have included in the series that that looks at the some of the most common reasons uh, based on research that women are held back in their careers that you can read on our website. Well, you know, I've written about this issue myself in the in bygone years, and one of the things people often said to me was that um, there's fewer women at the top because as women advance more senior, they leave more often. They don't mm -hmm. want to work, you know. They, and I always thought that was a little bit of a almost a self fulfilling kind of thing because you know the more women are blocked from you know um, or feel that the opportunities to them are are not there the more likely they are to move on and so then that makes people think oh women don't want to stick around and stay for these jobs and it's like well maybe they didn't leave because they didn't want to do the job maybe they left because they had no feel they didn't sense that this was going to happen for them maybe all the signals they were getting um, from above or that they were kind of stalled out or they'd hit that ceiling. Exactly. And I think when people see that happening, they can attach a narrative to it that most likely fits with their worldview. I think people yeah. who are, you know, inclined to to want to believe that women are just opting out because they don't want to are going to see that evidence. And I think people who think women are being, um, you know, unfair fairly victimized by sexism are all are going to then see this is 100% because uh, of, of pushback from above. And it, it's, it's different for every case. But what is undisputable and what our data shows and what our, our reporting has shown is that women are disproportionately hitting barriers that men are not in in their jobs. And um, this really comes to the the uh, a, a, a big part of the investigation that looked at gender discrimination laws. Yeah. And so let's get into this, because I think, certainly before I started doing this reporting, I had no idea that women were routinely being fired for becoming pregnant. I, I would have thought that that was a thing that my mother's generation had to deal with. Right. And there were laws against it. So, you know, if it ever happened, it would just be shut down right away. Exactly. Of course, no one would do that. But I can't tell you how many people we interviewed that had this happen. I think it's actually, it's something like eight in our story. And I mean, we like, that's not a, that's a, that's a, a small sample, right? Um, we have had laws on the books against paying men and women different uh, salaries for the same work because of their gender for more than 70 years in this, or for 70 years in Ontario. Um, we've had laws against pregnancy discrimination, against, um, you know, promotion discrimination based on, on sex for, for decades and decades, but they're almost impossible to enforce. The, uh, the court body that was set up to handle these cases is the human rights tribunal system. And the human rights tribunal system across the country is so dramatically under-resourced and understaffed that it takes many years to get a hearing. And then on top of that, if you do get a hearing, the damages are extremely small, usually between five and $30,000. And even if you win, unlike in a regular court system, um, the losing side doesn't pay the court costs. So if you've hired a lawyer, how much of your $20,000 win is going to go to a lawyer? Um, so if you're a woman and you face gender discrimination at work and you want uh, um, to go to the courts with this, that's what you're facing. And think of the ramifications that people face when they put their hands up. Like, you know, people you're watching, you work, how is your work going to take it if you sue them? Um, 
So what ends up happening is people don't complain or um, they leave quietly, just find a new job and no one really knows about what, what was happening. Uh, or if it's really bad, they end up entering into these settlement agreements that almost always include non-disclosure clauses. And what this means is the person has received a, you know, a compensation, a lump sum, like we've had a breakdown of the relationship, go off on your merry way. And the employer never has to fix anything because it's all done in secret. It completely obscures our understanding of the problem in this country. And I think this is a really big piece of this, especially when you talk about women at really senior levels who, who aren't going up. Um, many women uh, who switch jobs, you know, mysteriously, I, I, wish, I shouldn't say many women because it's impossible to know uh, the extent of this problem because it's all done in secret. But I can tell you in the two years I've spent interviewing this and speaking with experts, speaking with executives, speaking with women, it is very common that they have to do these settlement agreements with NDAs. You know, one of the things these NDAs uh, I, I've been trying to figure out and understand myself is um, if a woman signs an in, a non-disclosure agreement when she uh, after she makes a complaint about harassment or, or whatever the issue is, does this mean that she can't reveal how much money she was paid or does it mean that she can't even talk about what happened to her at all? So if there's other women in the organization or if somebody comes to her and says, you know, I, I, something terrible has happened to me, could she not even tell that other person that mm -hmm. she shared the experience or what happened to her? In case there's any lawyers watching, I'm sure you're shaking your fist at the screen saying like, they're called confidentiality clauses in Canada, not NDAs. That's American. Okay. So <laughs> All right. uh, I, I say non-disclosure agreements often because that's a term Canadians are familiar with because of the Harvey Weinstein reporting. Um, yeah, with confidentiality clauses, they're not even, they're not allowed to talk about what happened. They're not allowed to talk about the amount. They're not allowed to acknowledge that they exist, right? So that is the other challenge in reporting on these issues is you can't find them. They're uh, almost impossible um, unless you kind of hear word of mouth that something might have happened. But, um, you know, we interviewed people who had signed these agreements, but every single one of them in talking to us were, were breaking those, those clauses and taking a great risk, uh, including possibly having to repay um, the, the settlement that they'd received. So I think that when we talk about, um, not to get ahead of ourselves here, but solutions, the amount of secrecy involved in these deals, I think, is problematic. Um, there are lots of good reasons for them to exist. You, I don't, you know, you, when, you, when you interview employment lawyers, including, you know, feminist employment lawyers, they're reluctant to say we should do away with them because so often uh, people who have been victimized just want to move on with their lives. And this is a big um, stick that they have in, in fighting for themselves. And removing it would put would do them a disservice. So there's that. On the other hand, especially with public institutions, I do think that there is a role here where public institutions should have to disclose the types of complaints that they receive and how many settlement agreements that they sign every year. Um, when we we surveyed uh, the entities in our data set, and very few agreed to provide that information. Can I ask both of you, um, there's a question from uh, a viewer who uh, is curious. This question comes from Asaf Gerchak, who's wondering about whether you have ever taken a look at the men, um, the, the senior leaders who are men, in the sense that um, the question is, where are the men coming from who are in entire positions? Are they promoted internally while women aren't? Or are they more across different companies because of men-focused networks that benefit them and help them move uh, to new jobs while women are kept out? I mean, I have thoughts on this, but Chen, did you have anything you want to say? I'm babbling a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, from the data perspective, I feel it's really hard to identify that world where the, the network come from. We but I can touch on another finding from our analysis, which is the, the female dominated entities, which we found very interesting because we heard from people like, does women rise, uh, do women rise like in those like female dominated entities? And the first is there are not many of them. So out of 171 provided detailed information, only 24, 27 had more women than men. 
and um, and and half of those uh, female dominated entities, like there are uh, more female on the leadership team. So I think that's the picture we obtained from analysis, which is like uh, even in the entities where women outnumber men in the six figure earners, there's women are still not rising. Um, so I, I don't like how to track like uh, where do the women or men come from, but I will say like women are not really benefited in the female dominated entities at all. What I can say, I think this is a really good segue to uh, a piece that uh, my colleague former colleague, Christine Dobby, she's no longer with us. She's at the Toronto Star now, hashtag trader, hashtag just kidding, uh, we miss you. Um, but, Not a uh, but she wrote relating, <laughs> relating to the legal profession that I think translates everywhere. Um, uh, law is a, a profession that is often, especially at the big law firms, built on or your success in law is built on how you're able to, to um, uh, generate revenue, what business you're bringing into the firm. And this is where women are face a really significant disadvantage because men are more likely to refer work to other men. Um, and this doesn't necessarily have to be like consciously sexist or overtly sexist. I think people in general gravitate to people who are like them, that share their interests, that, they're, that they have an easier time building relationships with. So it's not really surprising in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but this impacts women uh, in, in law on two fronts, because one, within their own firms, the more senior lawyers are more likely to build connections with younger lawyers who are like them and share their interests, which unsurprisingly are going to more likely be men if they're men themselves. Um, and then out in the corporate world or public high level public sector world that is referring business to those law firms, they're more likely to build connections with with people who are like them, a.k.a. the male lawyers who are like them. And it's disrupting this cycle that I think is the real challenge here and where you see a crossover about how how this this food chain just really excludes not just women, but minorities of, of all sorts of demographics. Right. And. And um, when you talk about where the men coming from, I think I think uh, a lot of men get that there's a big problem and want to do better. And I think that also there is a natural defensiveness that happens when this conversation comes up. And I think that that is completely understandable in human nature um, on, on one hand. But on the other hand, it, it, it's not that any of these guys maybe don't deserve what, uh, you know, their job or anything. That's not what this is about. Someone's coming to take your job away. But it's understanding that obviously this, this system isn't fair, right? And, and if, you, uh, if you're good, you're going to get a job. If you're mediocre, you might have to work a little harder. And if you feel confident in yourself that you're good, you're going to do fine. You don't need to worry. So um, that's what this is, I think, uh, a, a lot about. Yeah, I think a lot of men um, are, I think the vast, vast majority of men are very well intentioned, and they would not think that they are a part of the problem mm. at all. Mm. Um, and I totally get that. But I think that exactly what you've said, Robin, there's a natural inclination to sort of gravitate toward people you're comfortable with, just naturally comfortable with. And so you tend to find yourself finding an easy rapport with someone who's like you and without meaning without thinking that you're in any way exclusionary or certainly sexist or anything else you just find I think some men find themselves mm. just sort of I like this guy and so we do business together and we refer business to each other and um, I maybe guy. they're golfing maybe they like golf <laughs> maybe they like to talk about sports but they just do why should I not talk about sports because I like right. sports and, and et cetera et cetera and so I think that um, maybe part of the solution is an a need for a much greater active awareness or an active, like taking an active role. And um, as on the part of men, of course, women too, but on the part of men um, to sort of say, okay, I'm going to try to overcome this natural inclination and try to try to reach more broadly. And let's um, take a second here uh, to address uh, an, you know, an uncomfortable reality too, that women don't always help other women either. That's a mm -hmm. thing. It's there's research that shows it. It's the queen bee syndrome. If there are women watching this, you you maybe had a queen bee in your life. 
Um, and there's research that backs this up that shows that um, if there are lots of women in the echelon above you in a workplace, there's lots of female bosses above you, you're more likely to be promoted. But if you work in an environment that where people feel tokenized um, and that there is kind of like there's only room for one syndrome, you're less likely to be um, to be promoted. So this system, um, everyone uh, if you buy into it, you know, women can effortlessly step into the, the role of the patriarchy as well, right? And I think um, to that point as well, the current system also hurts men. Uh, the stories that we've included on our, on our site that get into the research about the barriers that women face also shows how the status quo hurts men as well, uh, including research that shows that men who exhibit traits such as empathy, kindness, uh, are more likely to earn less than their male colleagues, that the current system penalizes male leaders who ask for help, um, that the current system, uh, act, there's actually evidence that shows that men who take time off to be with their kids are penalized to a greater extent than women, like, oh my God, that's scary. So um, if this isn't just about you know men not doing enough, this is also making sure women do, uh, do work too. Um, and I guess the to take a, a hard left turn here, the other component of that, that cycle, the networking, where there is some, some kind of sinister stuff that I think particularly men though do need to pay attention to is the boys club after work. There are lots of reasons why women do not want to go out drinking late and it has nothing to do with them not being fun or being so obsessed with their children that they cannot dare leave. And there are women who just want to be with their children, and that's great. I like to be with my children, too. But the I, I think I've gotten a lot of feedback like this, too, on Twitter or LinkedIn or, frankly, the Globe and Mail's comments section um, that uh, that talks about, well, you know, the you have to go out and network with clients, and that's just part of it. And sure, but um, there are serious safety issues for women sometimes when it is at night, when, uh, when there's alcohol involved, those are professional safety issues, um, as well as physical ones. So there, I hate, like, if there's any perception that women are not being routinely sexually assaulted or sexual harassed in the workplace still at night, it's happening, guys. I've seen the workplace investigations. I get the emails. It's very common. Uh, but it's really disadvantaged, uh, disadvantageous for women to to report those sometimes within their workplaces but the other thing is just the um the stereotypes or the perceptions around around women who are out with clients late at night right like they they might be branded because of frankly rape culture as oh like they're they're a party girl or something like th th this is what you're dealing with as a woman who's trying to build those relationships. Um, I can tell you like really early in my career, uh, when I was a young reporter, I was assigned to the police beat. And I remember asking my predecessor, who was a, an, you know, an older white man, like, how do you get police sources? And he's like, oh, just go drinking with them. And I'm like, you know, like 22. I'm like, oh, okay, just go drinking with them. And the number of times, um, I mean, I can tell you it was like three different times when I finally stopped and gave up that that uh, interaction turned really upsetting. Um, and I finally just started doing, I'll only do breakfast meetings now. And that's just the easiest way. But that put me at a big disadvantage to some of my male colleagues. And I'm not sure that men entirely realize that um, that situation that women are always up against, even sorry, and I'll stop talking in a second, but like when I go out for a run at night, um, my husband and I can run both when the kids go to bed, right? And it's like dark now at seven or something. So, but that idea that there's only certain roads that I can run on as a woman and he never has to think about that. And I'm not sure men fully understand how much of a woman's brain is constantly negotiating um, these risks, uh, both professionally, reputationally, and physically at all times in their day to day. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had a colleague, uh, a business, uh, Bay Street type business reporter who was out for drinks with a group of men from a, a company at one point, and she went to the washroom and another man in the bar uh, propositioned her. He thought she was a prostitute hanging around this high end bar looking for high end clients. Um, 
So it's, it can be hard doing exactly. the evening drinks thing on many levels. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the law firm research that, mm -hmm. um, that Christine did? And I know um, you worked on it as well. Um, because I think many of us would have thought that law firms were places where there were a lot of pretty powerful, pretty aggressive, pretty assertive women, that these are not the kind of people who would be you know, hesitant to advocate for themselves, if anybody in the world can advocate for themselves. And, um, and yet, talk a bit about what you found with that, with that data. I became interested in the legal profession with the power gap investigation, because when I was trying to find women who had encountered barriers at work, I thought a naturally good place to start would be employment lawyers. And I emailed, I don't know, like, like 100 employment lawyers across the country. I've spoken with dozens and dozens of them over the last couple of years. And so often uh, the conversation ended with them telling me their own horror stories that they've encountered in the workplace. And I was just, and like really bad ones. And I was just astonished at this irony, I guess, in some ways that the, the people, the white knights for women who are encountering gender discrimination in the workplace, the white knights who are tasked with defending them are dealing with their own battle behind the scenes in their own workplaces. And is that not just so discouraging? So that was where we really started getting into this. Um, Christine's, and I think part of it is that what I've heard to parrot kind of the, the, uh, the analysis from my sources, um, law firms know how impossible it is to enforce the laws. Uh, they're very aware of the huge reputational risks that a woman would take um, by coming forward and the very little payoff that they're going to receive, even if they win, and the ex huge expense of time and money. So they're much less afraid. Um, I think that that's, that's part of it, certainly what I hear. Christine's story, uh, which is just amazing. If you haven't read it, please go to our website and there's a little click on the at the top that says Power Gap and you can look at it. And I'm trying to find the name of it right now, but I will digress. Um, it really gets into the longstanding history of, of uh, inequities in the legal profession and especially as it relates to, to wages. And let's just take a minute to uh, talk about something that really flabbergasted me that I didn't know uh, before her work. The Women Lawyers Group, which is a branch of the Canadian Bar Association, um, in 2018, attempted to do a study of partner compensation. This is research that had already been successfully done in the U.S. and the U.K., and it showed a wage gap among partners. Um, the WLF, again, the Canadian Bar Association, tried to do this research. They hired a third party. Um, the, uh, they reached out to, you know, large firms, um, and tried to gather this information and the large firms refused to disclose it, even to the bar association, even if the information was to be presented anonymously, even if the information was to pre be presented as a percentage of partner income, not even a dollar figure. And they refused. So we actually, I can't say no if there is a wage gap among Canadian partners. Of course, we know there's a wage gap, but we can't know because they won't disclose this. And this is part of a broader trend, I think, in Canada where powerful institutions, companies, government, frankly, um, is ridiculously secretive about information that should be public. So um, that was her story just detailed that. And the um, I think that's really scary because you can't fix something if you have no idea what it is. A couple of days ago, we ran a follow up to that story where we were able to obtain internal partner compensation data, as well as information about associate pay levels from Castles, Brock um, and Blackwell. And it is the 15th largest firm in the country, it's about 250 lawyers, so a major firm um, that showed there was a 25% wage gap uh, between male and female partners. So in dollar figures, that meant that the average male partner at that firm was making something like $200,000 more than the average average woman. Uh, and it, another document that we were able to view uh, showed that the associate level, years one through seven, the male associates were out earning the women at every year in total compensation. And that male associates earn something like, um, I'm going to mess it up, but dramatically more of the proportion of bonus. I don't want to quote the exact figure because I don't have it, but something like 80% of the men got a bonus. And I think 
like maybe 60% of the women got a bonus or something to that effect. Um, so obviously a huge deal. And I think the, the big takeaway there is that we happened to be able to view the data from castles, but there's no reason to think that this isn't representative of everyone. And yeah. we can't know for sure because they refuse to say anything about the wage gap. So we have two questions, and one of them is about the lawyer, um, the, the the legal stuff. Um, just before I do that, I've been asked to just reintroduce ourselves just for anybody who's joined the call late. I'm Janet McFarland. I'm the financial services editor at The Globe and Mail, and I'm here talking about our Power Gap project with um, reporters Robin Doolittle and Chen Wang. Um, so one of the readers, Carmen Bruni uh, listeners, um, has said, I noticed the lack of spokesmanship from the men in the female partners earn less than male colleagues article. Um, um, and I do note that this panel is also made up completely of women. Um, so <laughs> I, that was, uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, the, the issue, um, although that was somewhat intentional on our part too. So why weren't any of these high earning lawyers running these firms willing to talk, comment more about this, uh, this uh, uh, discrepancy? And uh, the, Carmen says, it's my feeling that we need support from men to move the needle. I feel like we need to be having more open debates with men instead of just talking among ourselves as women. Um, either of you have any? I I can start because, um, you know, I, I, I want, I was, I, I was like, this whole project was a learning process for me as well to create awareness. So that's why, like, when you were talking about awareness part, I was, I can strongly resonate because I didn't have much knowledge about this. And just in the past couple of days, I was navigating Clubhouse, the Phoenix uh, application right now. And there's some room talking about gender equality. And, and I heard someone saying like, this, the, this is a problem like not caused by us, but have to be solved by us. And it's better in the problem than out of problem. For me personally, I was thinking as a data journalist, what can I contribute to this? So I was thinking like some people can resonate with personal stories. Some people need this really happen to them to realize this something. And some people maybe can resonate with hard code data. And I think my part is to bring this big picture and show people like even though this is not happening to you, not happening to the female around you, but from the data you can see that like it's happening and this is an issue uh, carry across many entities and pillars. Um, and sometimes like we do need to change on the, the on the like high level like systemic policies and like a, a company policy but also it's it's part of our day-to-day -day decisions and for me as a data journalist i think for I, I, it's a process for me to create an awareness and in my future story i definitely want to include this as part of my work and and also like want to push the data transparency issue to have more data to be disclosed that we can bring this issue on the scrutiny. Yeah, and then we have more uh, we have more stories coming. What about you, Robin? What do you think? I mean, there's a couple of things I can say. It's so hard to judge. I mean, um, I certainly saw a lot of men commenting on Twitter that this is a huge problem, and you know, tweeting about the Globe's article, and that was really encouraging. And I, and frankly, I have seen a lot of really positive responses to the series um, on social media, which has been really, really heartening. Um, I, I think there's maybe two things happening: is one, sometimes men don't know what to say because. They're, you know, navigating the, is it my place to say anything or what can I do? So I think there's a bit of that. I think the other thing is certainly what I've heard anecdotally um, uh, on Bay Street, uh, there has been um, sometimes formal, sometimes informal warnings not to comment or post about the Globe Power Gap series, which is which is wild uh, that that places are so... Um, concerned that if an employee tweets this, they might be viewed as criticizing them. And doesn't that, doesn't that just tell you everything you need to know? Um, if there are people watching here, especially that work at big law firms, I've emailed your law firm recently and asked them if they would be willing to proactively disclose some information. Um, and, you know, they, they, they refused a couple of years ago, but there's been such a huge shift, I think, and owing to the Black Lives Matter movement, that has really made uh, all institutions, companies, um, as part of our society, rethink this 
these things that have always been done a certain way or positions that have been taken in the past. And, you know, maybe they'll change their mind. So um, I would encourage you within your own work and your own structures to, to, uh, to ask for that, that support and men and women, and you do need men doing it too. Um, and that's uh, what you, I get messages from men being like, how do you help? And like, that's it. Sometimes, you know, a tweet is nice, but going to your manager or going to a boss and being like, you know, we really could be proactive and release this. Um, that, that, that does a lot more. I have an interesting comment um, that was submitted by Wendy Reed, who said, um, given the lack, given that the foundational problem or the source of the waterfall, if you will, is that women's roles can't change until men's roles or accepted norms change, wouldn't gender norms re-education in school be critical in the struggle? Is there research showing that younger men already have different views of power than the older white guys at the top? And and uh, what do you think about, um, you know, trying to reach the, the, the future generation of male leaders? You know, I think that that would probably create, you gotta pick your battles and just look at the pushback that happens trying to teach children about what their genitalia is called with proper sex ed education, uh, with the outcome being that they're more likely to be able to recognize abuse if they know what to call it and the immense pushback. So I think anytime you're gonna put like, gender, education, school, like people might freak out. I think, you know, I will say this generation, I think, so my, I'm an old millennial. The men in my life are so dedicated to their children and are taking time off. My husband and I split my leaves 50-50. Most of my male friends took like several months off on their leaves. I think that there is a shift that's happening um, I've heard that anecdotally interviewing people in law firms that, you know, the younger men on staff are taking time off. So I think there definitely is a shift um, and just normalizing that that breakdown um, of, of, you know, of who is actually taking care of kids and what traits do we value in leaders and who is a leader and what does it mean to be a good worker and what is a reasonable amount of time to work like these things are all these conversations are all happening. Um, there is one thing, though, that happened actually a couple of weeks ago with me that I think is very relevant to this question. I have a uh, one and a half year old and a three and a half year old, two little girls. We went to the playground the other day. Um, there's this like snow fort thing that had been carved out of Zamboni runoff snow, a big mountain. There's like tunnels. It's very cool. And there were, uh, you know, a couple of boys on there. They're probably like six six, seven, like, so very little. And they didn't want to let the girls on, not just my girls, but other girls. And we found like, okay, guys, like we're trying to be, you know, not helicopter parents, like, okay, boys, like let the girls have a turn. And they kind of did, but not really. And the boys eventually just like sat in the tunnels and refused to let any of the girls go. The other girls kind of wandered off and their dads were kind of sitting there chatting amongst themselves oblivious. And the power gap series had just came out and I was feeling really uppity about it. And I finally was like, okay, time for the girls to have a turn. And the dad's kind of like, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys, like time to get off. And all of the girls, my girls included, but other girls then ran to play on the plate, like on this snow set. And the, the boys just didn't, uh, the dads didn't do anything. And the boys just felt that it was theirs to, to stake out, including, you know, older girls, like seven, eight year old girls that hadn't been on it. So this stuff is learned from a very young age. And Am I saying that these dads are like horrible fathers and are teaching their children? No, I just think all the messages that we don't even realize we're receiving um, plays into this. They've done research actually on this in Europe that um, around uh, women being in positions of, of leadership in, in cities and city planning and how this can help. And one of the examples they've looked at is uh, playground structures. So little girls are less inclined to use playground structures when it's one big giant thing for this exact reason that boys dominate playground structures. And if you design playground structures differently and spread it out more into zones, girls will absolutely use it at the same rate as boys. And that's an example of when you have this power gap, the lack of women at the decision making table, you might miss these things not through any malicious intent, uh, but just lack of experience, lack of understanding that lived experience. 
I was very surprised with, um, um, you know, being more in the teenage years, um, the, the extent to which you actually have to say things to people, including young men. Um, they don't always think things through or intuitively, just because they're young, they don't intuitively understand all yeah. of these issues either. And I found myself confronting that at all too, um, for sure. You know, would you call yourself a feminist? No, mom. Why? But wrong answer. That's the wrong answer. <laughs> no, wait, wait. But, um, you know, <laughs> so... Okay, a deep yeah. breath. Let's talk yeah. about what that means. Um, you know, it, it, I think anyone at any age, I guess, I would say at any point in their career, you, you know, young men in their careers or mid mid level men in their careers, um, I think it, it, there's no um, there's no uh, harm or danger to having conversations to bring topics to the forefront and make people think them through that maybe just haven't really framed them in the same way in their own minds. Um, before in the past. Uh, so, you know, if somebody wanted my son to take some sort of um, gender and, you know, politics course or something at school, I'd be like, yeah, okay, go for it. Yeah, but I, I, and it, it um, shouldn't be scary, but I can just imagine. It. Yeah, I can imagine there would be <laughs> there would be a, a demographic that would um, push back uh, against it. Um, Chen, I, I'm just curious. Just did you um, did you work at all on the law firm data when you were uh, when Christine was researching this, or are you familiar with the data? Because I'm I'm actually just really curious to know if anybody looked at age um, or um, stage of career data as part of that. If if um, if the data was skewed by the fact that there's an older generation of white senior lawyers and if the next generation is fairer. Um, I'm sorry, unfortunately, I, I didn't work on that piece at all. <laughs> right. I can say that um, in Castle's response to our investigation, that was one of the first things they highlighted. And it is a completely important piece of this, that um, part of the, the issue here is that the firm has been uh, aggressively trying to increase the number of women who are equity partners. I think something like 19 equity uh, female equity partners have been added to the equity ranks in the last four years. So that's significant. They only have 116 now. Um, but one of the consequences of this is that women are at the lower stage of the pay grid and it takes time for them to move up the pay grid and Castle's identified this. I think this is an issue you see in law firms, but also in universities. So th I guess this is one thing I'll say if there's any you know business leaders listening. I think, uh, and I can say from my inbox and Twitter and the conversations that I'm having, I think women are completely capable of having this discussion and understanding that there are explanations for the wage gap. Um, some of them are reasonable. Some of them are not reasonable. If you don't have any information to work with, you can't sort out what's unreasonable and what's reasonable. If the problem is that there is a cohort of people that have been, uh, you know, working at this place for a long time, that they have a lot of seniority, they have this built up book of business, they they have these relationships, that that's a completely reasonable explanation. Um, and of course, we know that the, there were things that were happening at the time when they were moving their way up that were disadvantaging women. So of course, we know all of the caveats that come with this. But in terms of going forward, okay, we can't change the past, we can change the now, we can change the future. So what's being done to ensure that 30 years from now, the grid doesn't look the same, that it's more reflective of the population, not just on gender, but by every measure. Right, so exactly. That's what exactly. people want to know. So because this, I think that you could have said 20 or 30 years ago, well, you know, there's more fairness at the lower level and that'll eventually, you know, that, that, that is what people structure will move up to the top. And that there's been a lot of disappointment that it didn't happen. So, you know, I, hopefully these, this doesn't continue to be sort of the hope and not the real the reality as it as it plays out as these younger people move along. Yeah, um, I think we are basically out of time. We're coming up to the top of the hour, and we promised this would be an hour long session. So, um, I think we're going to have to wrap it up now and and uh, move on. I just want to thank everyone so much for tuning in to our um, our session, and thank you so much for those people who submitted comments and questions. It was really interesting to have your feedback as part of this. And of course, I also want to thank um, Robin and Chen for um, participating as well. Um, you can watch a live replay of this event uh, here on LinkedIn afterward if you missed some of it or if you know somebody that would be interested in watching it who wasn't participating today. 
Um, and also the replay of this event will be posted on the Globe's YouTube page. So I'm sure you can search and find that on YouTube. Um, I encourage you to also visit globeandmail.com for more of um, Robin's coverage and the Globe's coverage um, uh, of the Power Gap project. This is an ongoing project. It's going to continue um, this year. So there will be more stories. And in fact, if you go to the Power Gap Hub on our website, um, you can find it from our globeandmail.com main site, or you can actually go to TGAM, the Globe and Mail, TGAM.ca backslash Power Gap. Um, you can find the whole series on the hub. And if you click the follow button on that hub, you'll get notifications about new coverage as new stories are posted. So um, please, uh, please take a look at that and, and click the follow button and continue reading these stories. Finally, I'd also like to thank the people who produced today's event. This live stream was produced by Deb Bass, Jesse Wilms, Patrick Dell, and Timothy Moore. So thank you for your support. Again, thanks to everyone who joined and thanks to everyone who's been reading and please keep following our project.